Greetings, good evening, and welcome to IKG's Wisdom Wednesday. I am your host for this evening, Ajua, and we are so thankful and happy that you are joining us this evening. So for those of you who may be new, IKG hosts a weekly, a monthly lecture series known as Wisdom Wednesday, where we bring in speakers speaking on various topics related to Black history, culture, economics, spirituality, various areas of life that affect us as a people. And our goal is to bring in speakers who can shed light on information to help improve and inspire our lives, the lives of our family, our friends, our community, and our collective as a whole. And tonight will be no different. Uh, before we get started, do wanna go over a few housekeeping notes for you all. This is a webinar, which means that your mics are automatically muted and your cameras are automatically disabled. So we engage using the chat and the Q&A box. So throughout the presentation, um, we are going to be asking for your full participation. So feel free to share your thoughts and comments and engage with each other utilizing the chat box. There will be points throughout our presentation where we will take on specific um, questions from the audience. And those questions, we ask that you place those in the Q&A box. And um, what I'm going to do uh, before we get started is just acknowledge the people who are uh, present. We are so happy to get people from all over. And we wanna acknowledge where you all are checking in from. So we have Maryland, of course. So IKG, we're based here in Washington, DC. So the DMV area is always present. So uh, thanks uh, to the family from, from Maryland checking in. We also have Brooklyn in the house, San Diego, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, let's see. Who else do we have here? Uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Welcome. Welcome from the motherland. Thank you for joining us. That means so much. Um, greetings to our family in Wisconsin checking in. Atlanta again in the house. We have Alaska checking in. Welcome. Welcome from Anchorage, Alaska. Thank you for joining us. Let's see where else we got. Be more in the house. Canada, thank you. Kentucky, all right. Atlanta showing out. We got Atlanta again. Inglewood, California, welcome. Brooklyn's in the house. PG County's in the house. Plainfield, New Jersey's in the house. All right. And as you uh, come on in, feel free to just drop the city where you're located so we can see how uh, massive our family is. So thank you, everyone who. Uh, who join, who are joining us. So now we're gonna move into uh, tonight's presentation. We are so pleased and welcome to have joining us this evening, Baba Wakesa Mazimoyo of Aya Educational Institute. And he will be speaking on warriors, healers, builders, melanin healing science and black liberation psych ops. He writes that some of you have heard of the communication and conflict resolution technology of Wakesa Mazimoyo and Aya Educational Institute called Warriors, Healers, and Builders, AKA WHB. Tonight's presentation will show how that same technology guides the development of programs in our community and our school. Tonight's presentation will examine two programs, Melanin Healing Science and Black Liberation Psych Ops. Melanin Healing Science, years in the making, MHS is an example of warrior healer builders technology applied to, applied to physically heal our people and correct oppressive science pedagogy 
which counters our children's academic advantages and leaves our people dependent on anemic or malevolent medicines and medical practices. Many know of melanin. Few know how science has documented the use of melanin to heal our organs, like our hearts, ears, eyes, brains, and more, much more. Given the history of medical malfeasance and Black people, our learning to employ melanin in our healing strategies is key. When it comes to Black liberation psych ops, Vakessa writes, speaking of healing, menticide is real and is growing. Integration was an invasion. Self-doubt, self-deprecation, and deference to oppressors were injected into our veins and psyches. This injected oppression exists within us and between us. We are responsible for countering, healing, and flipping it from defense to offense. Such healing must avoid the trauma train and make us better builders with and for our people. Recovery must make us better warriors actively challenging people, policies, and practices that oppress us. To this end, Black Liberation Psych Ops is dedicated to extracting key ideas from thinkers, educators, writers, art historians, artists, psychologists, and organizers committed to Black Liberation Psychology. Once extracted, students will study and compare the ideas, then dramatically articulate the application to today. And about our speaker, Baba Wakesa Mazimoyo. He is a co founder and co director of Aya Educational Institute, who will be celebrating their 25th year in 2024. He is a nationally recognized speaker, trainer, and consultant, a warrior healer, builder, founder, and the Angola Zandiakina Black Self Healing Power and Therapy co founder. And for more information, we will place the website in the chat, but you can go to ayaed.com, I-A-Y-A-E-D.com. So please join me in welcoming Baba Wakesa Mazi Moyo. What's up, family? I'm so glad y'all are here. I'm we so are glad. here. Now, y'all, <laughs> let me see here. Let me get the uh, text chat so I can see it. Um, and uh, because y'all, you know, I want y'all make some noise up in here. I know your microphones or whatever, but you gotta make some make some noise with the text. That's some reactions. You can use the reactions. I see some hand claps. Uh, there you go. Uh, up. There we go. Use the reactions. Okay, and um, wonderful. I'll okay. turn it over to you, Baba. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and um. Everybody, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, thank you, first of all, to IKG. Uh, thank you to uh, Tony Browder, uh, my brother, Tony Browder, the scholar, Tony Browder, the founder of IKG, Tony Browder, the Egyptologist, uh, uh, Tony Browder, the um, curator, um, the brother uh, and uh, uh, publisher, the author. Uh, appreciate you, brother, and appreciate IKG, the organization which of course goes beyond uh, Brother Browder and um, includes uh, Ajwa, includes many um, uh, people that I know and love and people who make IKG what it is, uh, both in the, the DMV and in the nation. So it is with uh, much gratitude that I um, appreciate that you have called and have, you have um, or allowed me to come on to talk about warriors, healers, and builders, in this case, not so much as a communication and conflict resolution tool. Uh, in this case, it's more as a tool uh, for guiding program development. I want to slow that down because many of you have been introduced to WHB uh, and the tool set, Feelings as Messengers, River of Touches, because those tools are very powerful tools uh, to help heal the wounds of oppression that inflect infect our communication. So I'm uh, and and that's something we're very proud of. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. But also our warrior hill builder technology and afrientation uh, is um, key for us developing programs in our community um, that are, are healing um, and that are needed. And so tonight we're going to feature two programs that um, have been 
whose development has been guided by our warrior healer builder approach Afro, um, and technology. All right, so let's um, get to that this evening. Um, and let's see. Okay, hopefully y'all can um, see my screen. Yes, we uh, can. Okay, great. Uh, and so the two programs that we'll talk about, uh, well, but tonight, and let me just do a little introduction, then I'll give you a little bit back to WHB, it, uh, is Melanin Healing Science. Okay, Melanin Healing Science is a movement. It's also uh, a course. It's a course for adults. It's a course for our uh, high school youth. We actually have a middle school component. Uh, some of you may know that AYA is an educational institute serving adults and young people. And in the place of um, life science, which is middle school biology, we teach melanin mastery. So we introduce them to um, biology in middle school by introducing them to melanin and then going throughout their own bodies and then throughout the uh, beginning biological kingdom. Um, and then in high school, the course is black body biochemistry, black body biochemistry. We think it's actually best to introduce uh, formal biology and chemistry together, uh, starting with their own black bodies, and then of course extending through the other domains and kingdoms and phylums, etc. So, um, so melanin mastery and uh, and black body biochemistry is what we do in our school. The movement is called melanin healing science, um, and that's what we'll talk about um, and show you how. Um, melanin is is healing for us and at the same time helps to heal science. The other thing that we'll talk about is black liberation psychology. Uh, and uh, as a program that's developed out of WHB. All right. So let's move forward a bit. Um, the um, something that well, let me, let's just go on through Black Psych Ops, okay. All right, so first let's, let's, mm, it is not, um, all right. Let me talk a little bit about uh, the, um, talk about WHB uh, first and how it goes beyond communication. Warrior Healer Builder um, means uh, when we say warrior and our warrior action, we all, many of us are warriors and we do a lot of things uh, and, and that's wonderful. For us, we found it important to define what we mean by when I'm engaged in warrior action. See, I may be a warrior doing any number of things, okay, that contribute. When, when specifically when my warrior action, uh, that part has been activated, it means I'm challenging people, policies, and practices. And if you're taking notes, you might put those three Ps down. When I'm actively challenging people, policies, and practices, then my warrior part is engaged, right? When I'm, um, uh, when I'm, now let's go to the healer part, right? When my healing part is engaged is when I'm actively working to heal the wounds of oppression whether they are those that have been passed down in my family line, or whether they are those that come from um, hands up, don't shoot, or nine minutes of Derek Chauvin's knee on my neck. Now, I wanted to say a little bit about on my neck. Many of us here know of Derek Chauvin with his knee on George Floyd's neck. Um, and when we saw the videos, we identified with George Floyd. We certainly weren't, was not identifying with Derek Chauvin. And just as when you're in a movie and your heroine or hero is, is uh, in trouble, you may tense up, grab the, the edges and say, get out of there, or, or try to uh, think or bark some instructions. And you are identifying with and actually having emotions connected to that character. Well, in similar ways, when we see Derek Chauvin 
on George Floyd's neck than he's in many ways on our neck. And so we're talking about how do we heal those wounds, all right, that many of us just brush under the rug. And so whether the woundedness comes down my family line um, or whether it comes from current events, uh, forms of oppression, it's important that we heal those wounds of oppression. And that's what we're talking about when we say healing. Black people need a lot of healing in a lot of different ways. We need to breathe, we need to eat, we need a lot of things. And we're talking about when we say WHB, the H stands for healing the wounds of oppression and injected oppression that may have been passed down our family line or may be as a result of uh, people aggressing upon us today. The B stands for builders. And the key piece here for us is how do we knit trust so that we can build families, so that we can build organizations, so that we can build efforts together? How do we knit trust where distrust is induced? It's really important because I can grow food, but if it's in a torrential rain, how do I grow food in a torrential rain? I can say we ought to trust each other and we ought to unify. How do I build that actively? when distrust is being induced by our oppressors. I'm taught not to trust myself and I'm definitely taught not to trust you, especially with things important like my money. So when we say warrior, healer, builder, we mean specifically those things and those um, concepts and that approach is what guides the development of these two programs and many other, well, all of the programs that Aya does. And we want you to see the threads of that uh, as we look at this as a program development tool, okay? Um, now, I'm gonna pause right here because I wanna make sure that you got the Warrior Hiller Builder part. That's a short part, uh, but if you have any questions about that, um, let me know because it is that thread that I hope you follow as we look at um, melanin healing science and as we look at um, black the psychology of black liberation. All right, I see some of my folks up in the house, up in here. Um, and um, so I'm assuming that uh, the WHB, the Warrior Hiller Builder piece you have um, clarified, if you have a question about those three words and what we mean by them, uh, right now is the time to put them in the text chat. Um, so there is a question from AJ. Mm -hmm. AJ asks, I'm curious to know if you'll address how parenting can contain all these features. Uh, it's a great question. And because we are an educational institution uh, and we consider the parents the first educators and always the learning directors, the answer to that question is yes. And that is um, uh, these courses, for example, are, are courses that are taught to middle school students and high school students. Uh, and so um, you will see, uh, even though we also teach adult these class, adults uh, uh, these classes, they are tailored also. We you know, sometimes do them together, sometimes separately, but also so that they, our youth, uh, as they are learning about this, they are actually um, learning how to employ warrior skills and a mindset healing skills and a mindset and building skills and a mindset. Um, and if we're uh, talking about parents, uh, just as a parent, um, it's incumbent upon us to model for our children, us challenging people, policies and practices that oppress us and us engaging them in it and us telling them stories about um, our ancestors, about their family members, and about us challenging people, policies, and practices that aggress upon us. And I'm saying that specifically so they'll get clear about when I'm building, to, uh, which is important uh, so that we can become sovereign and we can become free. 
but also notice the difference between the hard work that comes from building and building trust among our people and the hard work uh, that comes when I'm actively challenging people and policies and practices. So here in modeling that for them, telling them stories about both our ancestors who did that and our family members who've engaged in it um, and continuing to be active in it now. It's important. It is not enough for us to build together for unity. We also have to challenge oppression now. Okay, It's not enough for us to heal the wounds of oppression because each one of these, warrior, healer, builder, requires skill sets uh, to be developed, requires a mindset to be developed. Oh, uh, George, um, not George, what's his name? Mike Tyson has a great quote that I love. He said, everybody has a great plan until they get hit. If I'm going to be challenging people, policies, and practices, have I prepared to hit? And have I prepared for their hit back? Have I prepared my family financially to take the hit back and to be able to counter? Have I prepared my relationships with my husband and wife uh, to take the hit because we don't need to live in some fantasy world. When we challenge oppression, folks will challenge back, all right? And we have to be prepared to take the hit and to counter that um, and telling them stories about when we've done that um, and, and the worthwhile of that and engaging in it ourselves. And we don't have to do it by, by ourselves. So that's, to me, important for for us as parents to model that. It's important for us to model also healing from the wounds of oppression, to talk about the wounds that have been passed down my family line, the light skin, dark skin wounds, the I'm not educated and therefore I can't solve problems wounds, the um, I can't trust black people wounds, the we are worst enemy wounds, um, the uh, I trusted a black person and uh, he or she did me wrong, uh, so I don't want to trust no black people no more wounds. All right, the um, you know, y'all act like y'all ain't got no white blood in you wounds. The, um, uh, we need to separate ourselves from them African people wounds. So, so it's important that we, again, actively engage in that healing and talk about it and talk about what we're doing with it ourselves, how we're in the process of healing or have healed, uh, and let them see that. Um, that's the best way as a parent. And again, building is join organizations. Have your children see you working with Black people. If all they hear is you can't trust Black people, that Black person stole my money. That Black person I couldn't trust. We are our worst enemy. That's what you're teaching them. You're teaching them not to trust or not to work to build black with Black people. On the other hand, if you join IKG, Iowa Education Institute, uh, other organizations, and they see you working with Black people, working through the conflicts with Black people, then in fact, they learn how to do it, and they learn that's what their work is to do, okay? And any if either of these legs are missing from the stool, it will fall. We cannot uh, get ourselves out of what we're in, out of the oppression that we're in, if we just do one or the other. We have to do all three, all right? Some people think, well, all we gotta do is build a better mousetrap. That's the building part. And then, it, then boom, racism is gonna take care of itself. Or some of us, if we just cross our legs and breathe just right through our nose and calm ourselves and we can heal the planet and that's somehow gonna heal these white folks from, um, from these draconian laws and from oppressing us. And that won't do it. We need to fight oppression we need to heal from the wounds of oppression. And while we do that, we still have to build families and organizations um, and businesses. And so uh, it, it's important and incumbent upon all parents to engage in all three of them in different ways and different ratios at different times in the year or different times in your life to, to engage in it, to bring them along and also to tell them stories of it having been done before. Hopefully that answered your question. Ozzy, was there, were there other yeah, questions? He, he, um, no, but he did say excellent answers. He loved what you were saying. So you definitely uh, did answer that question. All right, excellent, All right. excellent, excellent. Okay, so let's us um, move on. 
the uh, let's go here close that okay so let's deal with uh, how WHB has guided the development of melanin healing science. And along the way, maybe you'll learn some things about melanin that you didn't know. Now, this is not the full melanin science presentation, right? But this gives you a sense, some of the pieces from it and how our WHB technology guides that. All right, so racist science, or just a regular teaching of science, which is taught in a racist way, right? And not just by Europeans, if I've been trained by them and I don't change it, then in fact, my teaching, even though I don't have the uh, attitude of racism, it will come through the teaching of it. And I'll remind me to give you an example of that with something called, with vitamin D only, right? But just remind me of that. But right now, uh, racist science educates uh, and alienates us in two ways. It alienates us from ourselves, uh, our culture, our historic mission, and or it alienates us from the pursuit of science in the first place. So either uh, many times students are become good at science, but alienated from our people um, or from our way, or we're very connected with our people, but alienated from science. I don't do well in it. That's not my thing. That's white folks thing. That's Asians uh, thing, all right? Of course, you know that that's not historically true. At the same time, if you think about going, you're going through school, think about if even if you were great at science, how hard you had to work to apply that science to our people and to our culture and changing our conditions because that wasn't part of the curriculum. Or um, how much uh, you were alone in the science, advanced science classes and when you know, maybe you got about 20% of folks who moved on and the other 80% of black folks said, mm, I'm through with it, through with it. Well, there is nothing inherent either about our brains or inherent about science that would want us and have us be, so many of us be through with it. It's the teaching of it that either has me uh, uh, excel and I don't know how to apply it or don't have the proclivity to apply that to, to solve our problems. I'm glad that I got the science. I may be able to get better jobs and that's a great thing. It's just that the, the teaching of it is not going to have me apply the science to making our community better and stronger, right? Um, even if my job is to close the gap between black folks and white folks, and don't get me started on the gap. And the, on the other hand, most often, if you look at the numbers, is I'm through with it. I really don't want to pursue uh, science careers because they're alienating and I'm, I don't feel and see myself in it and see people in it. So I'm down with my folks, but I'm alienated from the pursuit of science and the skill. We lose either way. If I'm great at science, but I don't know how to apply it or don't have a proclivity to apply it to my people and improving our condition, then black people lose. Or if I'm down with my folks, but I'm afraid of science or my science skill and approach has been as atrophied, then that doesn't serve us because I'm dependent upon Fauci and the World Health Organization or other folks who don't have our interests at heart, I'm depending upon them because I don't trust my science skill because those atrophy. So alienation is critical that we heal it. In fact, in the words of uh, uh, Dr. Amos Wilson, any education for black people, any African-centered school, homeschool or approach if it's to claim that it's African-centered, it has an obligation and a requirement that we heal alienation. And that's out of WHB. And so therefore it's going to shape how we create and how we teach science. So enter as an, uh, an answer one is melanin healing science. So if we're going to introduce middle school biology, we introduce it with melanin mastery. 
We're going to introduce biology and chemistry. We introduce it with black body biochemistry so that as the students are learning, they're also are being reconnected and tied even closer to our people. And let's look at how we do that. So let's look at some of the ways that melanin heals us. Right? Let's start with something as simple as mosquito bites. Right? Those of you here um, probably remember being bit by mosquitoes when you were young and scratching those mosquito bites. And what did your parents tell you? They said, stop, don't do that. Don't scratch the bite. When I asked people why, they said, because it's going to uh, scab up. And then when the scab heals and drops off, there's going to be left with a what? Scar is what we're taught. A dark mark. What is that? What is that dark mark? It's melanin coming to the tear in your skin to help you heal. Melanin is a healer. And you see it every time, or most times, you have skin damage. Cuts, your keloids, for those of you who have them, are darker typically than the rest of your skin. Melanin coming to help in the healing of your skin. Now, when I teach students that, one student named uh, Jamil held up his arm like this. He said, is that why that's dark? I fell down and skinned myself there and, and that's darker. And I said, yes. And it was amazing to him, right? That this melanin there, which he'd been taught to kind of be ashamed of because it was darker, what actually was an example of melanin coming to help him heal. Hmm. Already, we're healing alienation. Now, of course, we need to then go, and I'm not going to do it tonight, but when, once he said that, I said, well, let's go and see if we can find some research that supports my contention and your discovery that melanin actually heals our skin, helps to heal our skin. And then number two, let's look at its action. How does it do that? You see, the first thing, finding melanin, is what a reporter would do. Coming to understand how it heals is what begins to make a scientist. And he did. And the rest of the class did. The next thing on the list, melanin and birth. The um, melanin, I hope y'all know, accompanies all birth. I had a great conversation with Sister Laura before this call, uh, who's a nurse, you know, who actually has found some tremendous uh, information about this melanin in birth. Um, and we will be working together uh, to go deeper. But she's found some tremendous research that I had not discovered. So what is this melanin and birth? You already know that it does. You've already seen it. How many of you, either having been pregnant yourself uh, and as your stomach gets bigger, there's the development of this black line? The quote unquote formal name for it is the Laina nigra. The Laina nigra. It just means black line. And sometimes the line is big and, and fat, sometimes it's thin, sometimes it's darker. Um, and but it accompanies all birth. White women even get the black line. It's just not as black as ours, and they go to their dermatologist to try to get rid of it. But not only in the black line, many times women report that their skin gets darker, their necks get darker. Many parts of their body, why? Why does melanin seem to expand and flourish whenever there is birth. And when we show pictures of this, we then go to our students and we ask them to go home. And I encourage you to do the same thing, no matter how old you are, if your parents are still living, or if, you're, um, if they're, not, they're not living, 
think about yourself if you've had a Laina Nigra and ask yourself about that. So for our students, they have to go and ask their parents, mothers and grandmothers and aunts about this thing called the Laina Nigra and comparing the way theirs looked with the way it looked when they had a sibling, for example, and beginning to deal with the particulars of it, um, if they got pictures of it. And so the beautiful thing about this is that we're using the study of melanin accompanying birth to have them closer to their mothers. And I'll ask you, what science experiment did you have in middle school or high school? What assignment did you get that made you closer to your parents, to your mother? I didn't have any. All the assignments I gave, none of them made me closer to my father, to my mother, to my people. But we are about melanin healing science so that we're healing alienation as we're teaching science. When the students come back in with a write-up of their Laina Nigra story, many of them have, have theories. One student had a theory that, well, um, my theory is that the line is bigger with girls and thinner with boys <clears throat> because that's the way it was in her family reported by her mother. Another student says, well, actually my mother told me the opposite. So now they're discussing their theories of the Laina Nigra, okay? From there we say, okay, that's the outside. What's going on on the inside? Let's see if we can find melanin. We find melanin in the ovum. We find three days after the zygote, the hormone that's being produced by the morula or marula, which means mulberry. And if you've seen a mulberry, you know what it looks like. It's dark purple or black. Hmm. No sun's there, there's no sun there. But it is producing a hormone called the melanocyte stimulating hormone within three days of the egg and the sperm joining. We then follow that on through the development till we get to the fourth week and we begin to learn about the um, neural crest and the seven different places the melanocytes go to that will become your eyes, that will become the uh, brainstem, it goes to the medulla oblongata, um, that will become your hair follicles. So we, a tracing melanin and embryology. And the students are paying attention and can repeat it back because it's no longer alienated knowledge. They're learning what's went, what was going on with their own mothers. Hope y'all are with me. Hope you're beginning to appreciate what happens when we teach science in ways that are connecting instead of alienating the students' attention go up. And this is, doesn't matter whether you're talking about young students or older students. So um, they become better scientists. So now as I keep going, melanin and the immune system, we go there. And here we introduce not just melanin in our skin, and we haven't even got to neuromelanin yet we introduce something called allomelons, A-L-L-O melons. What are they? Those are plant melons. This is blackberries, blueberries, black garlic, black rice, black eyed pea. And we begin to look at what happens when we consume allomelons. And particularly what happens with allomelanins and our immune system. So for that, I'm going to uh, go and take you on a little trip. See if we can find some 
some of those. Hope you're still breathing. Hope you're letting some of it sink in. Um, well, uh, incidentally, this is the well, we'll we will cover that. That's let's go through and and let me follow follow my own lead here. Here we are. There's research published in the um, journal Clinical and Pharmacology and Toxicology. This is 2017. The pharmacological properties of melanin is function in health. Okay. And we're going to go a little deep. And what we're looking for is melanin in our immune system, okay? Um, can y'all still see my screen? Somebody say something. Yes, we can. Beautiful, thank you very much. Okay. So the, let's see if I can zoom it in for us a little bit here. All right, so black mushrooms are also a source of melanin. Again, like I said, black rice, black garlic, et cetera. And here, in this experiment, they're taking melanin extracts, extracts um, uh, from plants. In this case, it's from uh, cinnamon. Uh, so Rev uh, Skaya in 2012 investigated the possibility of creating an efficient oral radio protectant. In this case, radio means from radioactivity based on melanin using edible black mushrooms. Prior to the administration of 9GY total body radiation in mice, the location of the mushroom derived melanin in the body before irradiation was determined in vivo uh, by fluorescent imaging. In vivo means in real life in their bodies as opposed to in vitro, which would be in the test tube. Ingestion of black mushrooms. Now, again, we're talking about aloe melanins, A-L-L-O melanins, plant melanins. Ingestion of black mushrooms protected 80% of the mice from the lethal dose. Whereas the control mice or those given mushrooms lacking melanin died from gastrointestinal syndrome. Hope y'all with me. Does this have diet implications for us? Absolutely. Does it have healing implications for us? Absolutely. Do you think you and or students are now more interested? Oh, absolutely. Let me continue. Notably, mice that were given white mushrooms, but then they supplemented with melanin, survived at the same rate as mice that were given black mushrooms. An excellent study to make sure that the ingredient that accounted for the 80% survival rate was melanin, plant melanin. The authors concluded that melanin containing mushrooms can provide significant protection against radiation and could be developed into an oral protectant, or we just could eat more aloe melanins. Similarly, quinoa at all, study the probable mechanisms of radioprotective, again, again, against radiation now, action of extracellular melanin isolated from this fungus in mice after exposure to 7GY whole body radiation. And they found that administration of melanin at a dose of 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight increased the survival of mice by 100%. 
Mice that received melanin displayed reversion of radiation-induced reduction of extracellular signal, uh, excuse me, signal-regulated kinase phosphorylation in splenic tissue. I hope I'm not boring you. I hope that you are learning something about melanin. I'm intentionally not starting with the pineal gland. I want you, us to know by just eating black mushrooms, black garlic, black eyed peas, by making sure that melanins are in our diet, that we get healing from them, healing from radiation. All right, let me go back. Um, I'm not looking at the text chat, but if, if let me tell you something. I was so excited about it. Students are so excited about it. Okay. Um, let's keep on. So what does this got to do with your immune system? Everything. The same article goes into detail about how melanin is an immune system regulator, modulator. What does that mean? Turning your immune system up and down. So our N'Golo movement that we started at the beginning of COVID, designing to boost our immune system, a key part of that protocol was us eating melons. And I can show you a bit of that. Because for us, regardless of whether you are gonna take a vaccine or not, any vaccine, the best it can do is to stimulate or to trigger your immune system to give your immune system practice. Well, if I have a strong immune system, then the response is going to be better. This is important because many people were duped to believe that the vaccine would actually work on the COVID virus and do something with it, kill it, ameliorate it, slow it down. Absolutely not. All it did at best, and we're not even talking about the side effects, we're talking about all it did or any vaccine at best was to stimulate an immune response. If my immune system is made stronger, then guess what? My response, the healing response will be stronger. And so for us, a key part of that, making our body stronger, here is a, a protocol example, was to use allomelanins to strengthen our immune system. And so um, here, right here, number two, feed our blackness, both with melanin and with black culture. Activate our body melanin plus supplement with allomelanins as well as with black cultural mission. Let me keep going. Melanin, the sun blocker. I put this in because there's always controversy about whether you, we should use sunscreen or not. And so um, the, the students were uh, uh, excited about this, their parents and others, uh, you know, uh, black people do get skin cancer, the research shows or some research shows. Hmm, it's true, but not from the sun. The cancer that we get, cancer of the skin, it's called squamous. We get it on our hands and feet. It's usually from dealing with toxic material, not skin cancer from the sun, not melanoma. In the main, I don't mean that you cannot find an occasional uh, um, exception to that. But melanin does not block anything. If you're taking notes, write it down, please. Melanin does not block anything. For those of you who are just coming in, we're talking about melanin, the sunblock on the left. Melanin does not block the UV rays from the sun. In fact, much more effectively, melanin absorbs those UV rays and turns it into life-giving nourishment. It literally absorbs the rays. Now, the first piece of information and misinformation you'll get about melanin from scientists is that melanin is a sunblock. 
And that's how it protects us. It's right that it protects us, but not by blocking. The next folks who will concede that melanin absorbs those UV rays from the sun, and they say that melanin just dissipates that energy as heat. No. Melanin converts that energy, deposits the energy into your cell cytoplasm. Now, how do I know this? Well, we have no, can look no further than the, than Ukraine. Ukraine is in the news. But in 1986, Ukraine was in the news for another reason. The Chernobyl nuclear plant exploded. The explosion was 100 times greater than the bomb that the US dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As a result of that, there was an exclusion zone, a thousand miles wide, or a total of a thousand miles in the exclusion zone. So you're not supposed to go in there. And of course, over time, people would go in, they'd be suited up or saying where they could go. So some scientists in 2007, Katarina Darachova, and uh, Arturo Casadeval from the Einstein Institute in New York ventured into the reactor or into that space and they found growing in the reactor and growing around the reactor fungi. And the fungi was healthy. The fungi had become melanized. That is, it was a ring of melanin around the fungi. And this melanin was not blocking those harmful gamma rays. Instead, it was eating those gamma rays. And it was quadrupling the metabolism of the fungi. That means the fungi in and around the reactor grew faster, stronger than fungi not exposed. I hope you're hearing me now. Because when you want to talk about melanin as a, and a sunblock, or you want to talk about melanin as sunscreen, if sunscreen blocks your UV rays and melanin absorbs the UV rays and converts them into nourishment for fungi, then maybe you are blocking yourself of healing energy. Hmm. I'll say more if you have questions about that. And then there's melanin. I'm just going to summarize some of this here. I'm hoping that you're, you're looking at how as you, not only you're learning different things, you're becoming more curious as a scientist. You want to know more. You want to see the studies. You want to read the studies. You want proof of this. Sounds too good to be true. And if you are reading the stories, if you're wanting to know more than the scientist in you is being activated by melanin, because melanin is actually healing the teaching of science right here, right now with you. I said to you earlier that and the embryo goes um, and part of the melanin, uh, melanocytes go to the medulla abdomgara, to the brain stem. According to Dr. T. Owens Moore, great researcher, Dr. Uh, Bynum, great researcher, and many others, there are 12 melanocytes, excuse me, 12 melanin centers in the brain stem. So we have renamed the brainstem to call it the melanin corridor. Hmm. One place that's popular is the substantia nigra. The reason it's popular is because a lot of research has been there because of um, Parkinson's disease that historically, though it's changing, but historically has affected white people, Europeans much more than Africans. And as they've been studying Parkinson's, they've discovered the substantia nigra 
again, you remember the Laina Nigra, all we're talking about is the black stuff or the black substance in the brain and the dopaminergic neurons, when that black stuff begins to deteriorate, then the motor neurons, the dopaminergic neurons that control voluntary movement deteriorate, when they deteriorate, then you begin to get involuntary movement. The substantia nigra is just one of the melanin centers in the brain and it's key for our movement and locomotion. There are others like the locus corellius in the melanin corridor. A couple other places and then we'll have you see if we can entertain some questions. Melanin, vision, see better, stare into the darkness, the blackness. Don't focus, just take it in. Let the blackness heal the wounds. Let it teach you how to see and how to see farther. Learn the powers of melanin to heal and transform. Did you know that without melanin, you would be basically blind? Your seeing would be impaired. Not only do you have melanin in the uh, iris, the eye, the part of the eye that gives you eye color, and it doesn't matter whether it's blue or whether it's gray or whether it's green or brown or black. Melanin is responsible. And the darker it is, the more you melanin that you have. Yes, there's you melanin and theo melanin. There's neuromelanin we were talking about in the substantia nigra. But here there's melanin in your eye. And the purpose of it in terms of your iris and the color of it, the darker your eye, the more healthy. The darker your eye, the more the melanin is absorbing those harmful UV rays and converting them to healing for your eye. So I know many of us are taught that we will be happy if we have blue eyes or green eyes and the lighter eyes we have, the better. But if you're talking from a health perspective, you want to have the blackest eye you can find. Melanin is not only in our iris, it's also in our macula. When you look through the pupil, the black hole, it's just a hole. The reason it is black because of the melanin in your eye for the same reason that the lens in your camera is coated with black so that you won't have refraction of light. Melanin, without melanin, you won't see as well. Think of albinos. Why are their eyes pink? Because of the lack of melanin. Why do they not see as well? Because of the lack of melanin. And we won't go into it tonight, but the same is true of our hearing. Let's go one more before we begin to take any questions that you have. Melanin is a stable free radical. What is that? Well, melanin is a powerful antioxidant. There are many different antioxidants in our body. Melanin is one of the most powerful of them. What does a free, what does an antioxidant do? It quells free radicals. If the sun has hit someone's skin and the UV rays or other rays have, uh, excuse me, I don't know what happened there. Um, if the UV rays have uh, knocked off an electron uh, from the atom, so it's no longer paired electron, then the, um, that uh, unpaired electron uh, creates a free radical. That atom becomes a free radical and it can begin to do damage to uh, other cells scavenging other atoms for electrons and creating a cascading reaction. And many times that's how cancer develops. Melanin says, oh yeah, young fella, I understand you, you're a little bit you know, off balance. Here, take one of mine. Take one of my electrons so that you're balanced. So the question becomes, if melanin is giving up electrons to have other atoms in our body become stable, to prevent disease, then why isn't melanin becoming a free radical? 
Well, technically it is, but melanin is what's called a stable free radical. I want you to think on that for a minute. Let it sink in because melanin has some lessons for us. Maybe we need to become stable free radicals. How does it do it? As we began to answer the question of that, the simple answer is that melanin never shows up alone. Melanin is a polymer. I like to say it shows up with a family, with a posse, with his ancestors, with his family. It never, you will never find the melanin molecule, will never find one melanin molecule. It always shows up as a family, otherwise known as a polymer. Hmm. Hmm. So what does that got to do with it becoming stable? Well, there's sharing within the family. When I have to give up one of my electrons so that my cousin is more stable, then the family shares their electrons with me. Hmm. Maybe we ought to emulate melanin. Now, for the science and to us, scientists and us, if we want to come to understand just how does it do that sharing, now we have to get into the functional groups and we have to get into quantum chemistry. And it's not hard for us to conceive of or understand. So we've gone from melanin being an antioxidant to becoming to understand melanin shares as a family to now understanding quantum chemistry where sharing of electrons in the melanin molecule happens from different energy levels where a electron can be in two places at one time, quantum. Was it once a wave and then a particle, quantum. In fact, it also does that in our eye. In fact, it also does that in the Chernobyl nuclear plant for the fungi. Let me stop right here. Hopefully you have some questions about it. Hopefully you learned something about it. Hopefully this foray into science going through the door of melanin has opened some ways for you to become a better scientist. All right, uh, Ajwa, would you lead us into any uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, okay. All right, so um, before I begin with the first question, we're taking questions around this particular topic around the melanin healing science. So um, as I'm asking these questions, if you have some, please feel free to drop those questions in the Q&A box. And again, we will still have an overall Q&A at the end of tonight's presentation. So um, our first question is from Gertrude, and she understands what you were saying about black mushrooms. And she asked, what about brown mushrooms? Same. Does... Okay. Um... <laughs> that is, thank you for asking. Brown okay. mushrooms are, are also melanized, okay? The bark on the brown bark on the tree is melanized, all right? Um, uh, most times when you see color, even bright color, oranges and whatever, Melanin, as as the is is involved, like blue eyes, actually are derivative of melanin. What does black do, y'all? What remember when you uh, in our lessons in art, white is the absence of color, and what is black? Who remembers? It's a combination of all colors. Okay. And so um, when you see brown, you're seeing melanin. All right, other questions? Okay, we have some answers in the chat to your question. What the did they, what did they say? Colors. There you go, that, that it. that's it. Okay, our next question. Um, is color blindness more prevalent in non-melanated people? Two-fold question there, non-melanated. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a great question. Actually, 
I don't know the answer to that particular question. I do know for the ears that um, uh, because of melanin in our ears, we have, Black people have less hearing loss and more hearing protection than any other ethnic group in America. I know that. So I don't know the particular, I haven't looked at that particular thing. It's a great question. Uh, I'll look at that. Okay. All right. We have, I can tell you, we also have less macular degeneration than any group, okay? And um, uh, and the uh, work of a Mexican um, Dr. Uh, Arturo Solis Herrera uh, documented the, the use, the presence of melanin in our eyes um, for the, the more healing of our eyes. Um, and in fact, has posited that it is melanin interacting with water that facilitates human photosynthesis. His name is Arturo Solis Herrera. So my guess would be yes, but I don't know that. Okay. Okay. Um, so a couple of questions from AJ. AJ, melanin seems to grow and spread when exposed to the sun. Would you consider it to be alive, part A? And part B, does complete darkness also help the melanin in some way? Uh, part A, uh, yes, get as much sun as you can. <laughs> okay, really, y'all, we are people, children of the sun. We are people of the sun. Get as much as you can. Uh, melanin will grow. Um, in fact, when you're darker in July than you are in August now than you were in March, it is because your melanin has developed more, all right? And um, uh, the darker you're getting is not just darkness, it is more melanin development. You don't need your melanin as developed in the winter as you do in the summer. Um, and, and so within the summer months, we don't, I want you, the reason I'm saying it is because we, we know we get darker, we don't know we get better. We know we get darker, our skin gets darker. We don't know that that darkness is advanced development, okay? Uh, and so be careful if you're just gonna go for a vacation and it's December and you've been inside, all right, all winter or January, and then you're gonna plop yourself out on the, in the Bahamas in the sun as if you've had time for your melanin to develop. There you want to be careful, all right? Um, and so, and give yourself your melanin time to adapt. All right, so uh, melanin, then our bodies grows um, and uh, in the presence of the sun. Um, but you also need to know that in your, with the Lina nigra and in your womb and in the male testicles and in your ear, th there's not a lot of sunshine going on, but melanin still proliferates in your brain, neuromelanin. So yes, sun, uh, melanin does, uh, get stronger, but melanin also gets stronger to serve us whenever there's excess toxicity in our ears, for example, in our eyes. I really want you to get it. Melanin is, is not just a sunblock and it doesn't just respond to the sun. It also responds to our body's needs. When you scratch a mosquito, bite uh, and, 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 and whatever. Melanin is not coming there because your mosquito bite is in the sun. Melanin is a healer of our bodies. Melanin mm -hmm. in snakes, melanin, so many things. So let me, uh, that's the first answer. What was the second part of that question? Um, let's see, the second part of the question was, does complete darkness help the okay. melanin in some way? Well, when we, when we have complete darkness, then what we get is the um, melatonin uh, mother load, okay? And melatonin is not melanin, please don't confuse it. Melatonin signals the pituitary to, to create more of the melanin stimulating hormone. And so that when it is light, melanin actually will be more active and activated. So that we do need to sleep as much as we can in complete darkness. So there is a correlation. And that bridge is something called the melanocyte, I said melanin before, but in the melanocyte stimulating hormone 
out of the pituitary gland. It is that same hormone that three days after the uh, egg and the sperm meet is developed, uh, is secreted by the morula. Okay, so keeping, I'm gonna combine a few questions. Um, keeping with melanin and healing, there's a question around, can melanin heal eczema, diabetes, uh, the role of cinnamon uh, in our diets, could that help with melanin? And then finally, um, let's see. Uh, Yeah, if you could talk about that, vitamin D, um, diabetes. So the role of, I mean, you're talking about melanin and healing, but mm -hmm. I guess you are asked about specific uh, diseases. Um, exactly how does that work? Okay, great. Um, because I mentioned- oh, Including in trauma. That's, that was the other part. So physical ailments, but then also mental, psychological uh, ailments such as trauma. Okay. Um, melanin is trying to help your body heal wherever it can. Okay. Um, and, uh, and whatever ails you, and I don't mean it's universal. I mean, where it can, it's going to help. All right. Um, and not just in humans, um, in cockroaches. That's why they're brown. That's why it's hard to kill them. Okay. Um, in ants, in arthropods, in cephalopods, okay, melanin throughout the throughout the animal kingdom. Um, interestingly, a polar bear is not white; its fur is white for camouflage. Its skin is black. Okay, so melanin will is attempting to help us heal in a number of different ways. And this for this, I'll go to Dr. T. Owens Moore, um, and um, let me put this back up on the screen. Um, and somebody asked, you know, uh, other resources. Um, well, we're producing uh, documents from our course. The first thing I'd encourage you to do is put your email in the text chat because there will be starting in September, um, a melanin uh, course for adults and for teachers, okay? Um, and, uh, and so in that place, you're able to get uh, access to um, a number of um, documents and pieces of research. There also is, if you join our network every month, and this is a select group for $12 a month, you get access to ongoing research that I'm doing, including where it comes from and all that stuff like that, because it's an ongoing piece. Um, so but let me find the answer, uh, Dr. T. Owens Moore, because this is this is critical for your examining, beginning to guide your, your melanin research. Um, so this is Dr. T. Owens Moore, and this is when he was teaching at Fayetteville State University. He's now chair of the psychology department um, at Clark Atlanta University, um, scholar extraordinaire and friend. Uh, these three, um, we add a couple to it, but these are the key three functioning. So whenever you find melanin, we ask, is it functioning as an antioxidant in this area? Is it functioning as a nerve conduction facilitator? Is it functioning as an energy transformer? And if so, how and where? Um, so in the inner ear, for example, it's functioning as an antioxidant uh, to help heal autotoxicity. Auto as in O-T-O toxicity, not auto as in autoimmune. And this comes from uh, Tylenol and over-the-counter as well as prescription drugs that are given regularly that are known to be toxic to our ear and damage the hearing mechanism. Melanin, as an antioxidant, helps to heal that. Also, as a nerve conduction facilitator, it facilitates us being able to um, hear uh, and uh, the the nerve impulse getting uh, from our inner ear to the uh, hearing center in our brain through the auditory nerve, all right? And also it's an energy transformer because when we hear sound, we actually are hearing the compression of, of uh, airwaves. The students were amazed when I said, there is no sound without air. 
And I said, try to scream, but the only caveat is you cannot let air out. And they were like, wow. And then one student said, is that why there's no sound in space? I said, you got it, right? So what we're hearing is actually vibrations of air that hit our, come through our ear canal, hit the tympanic membrane, then go to the incus uh, malus and stapius, and from that go to the press on the cochlea to begin to have the stereocilia, excuse me, the lymph, um, the, the lymph fluid uh, vibrate, and then from that the stereocilia and blah blah. But the point I'm making is it transfers from a mechanical sound from a compression of air to having to be transferred into electrical energy that goes to the auditory nerve. So that energy transformer or converter is critical. So in our inner ear, all three of these actions are, um, are working. And part of what's important is to learn how they are working and where. But now that you have at least three, and I mean, there's some other key things, but these key functions, when you look for melanin where it is, ask yourself and your research, how is it acting as an antioxidant here? Is it? Is it acting as a nerve conduction facilitator or you need to transform it? And what is it transforming? So that means you begin to go from a reporter, melanin is in our ear, we got it and you ain't got it, to the scientists understanding how the ear functions and how melanin in one of these three roles may be helping it achieve the hearing. And there are sounds that black people hear that typically white people can't hear because it's a nerve conduction facility. All right, hopefully, let's see here. Um, oh, very excellent, um, very thorough answer. Um, so again- There, there, is, a, there is a Edward Carter saying, what are the metaphysical aspects of melanin or do we need to buy a class? Um, well, here is a, one of the things that I intentionally do. Okay, there, there is uh, Dr. Bynum uh, and others really, there's a lot of focus on the esoteric and metaphysical aspects of melanin. And I've decided that I will leave that last. I mean, I don't mean I won't go into it, but let me just tell you, the problem with, with uh, as I've observed over the years, the miseducation that has us alienated from science means we're not finding the metaphysics in the science. We're ignoring the science to go to the esoteric because we're more comfortable with it. The only reason we're not comfortable with the science, because that's not the case in ancient Kemet, it's not the case in ancient Benin, it's not the case in ancient Zimbabwe, but owing to the racist teaching and the alienation of us from science, when we talk about melanin, we gravitate to the pineal, we gravitate to the metaphysical, but I just showed you some metaphysical when I said quantum chemistry, because quantum is in fact metaphysical. So I like to have us begin to go through how melanin heals our bodies. And when we, when we begin to look at the symbology of that, like melanin showing up as a family, they would say a polymer, and the sharing uh, using quantum chemistry of electrons so that it becomes stable, then you begin to extract some of the metaphysical by your awareness of the scientific as it um, shows up in our bodies. Because I want to heal our alienation from science. That is why I, we've not talked about the metaphysical aspects and we won't tonight, okay? Except for as we come to understand the science of it, then we can f follow the science to get to the metaphysical. That's what we did in ancient Kemet. Please, I want y'all to notice the gravitation to melanin most times as the metaphysical while we run away from the science. That is not innate to us. And that is not our cultural way. That is the imposition of European training on us. All right. So, Bob, there's so many more questions, but I know there's another part to your presentation. So what I'm going to do is pause these questions so that you can continue. And then um, we will pick up a few of these questions during 
our final Q&A. All right, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate y'all's questions. I appreciate your interest. Um, and hopefully you will sign up for more uh, information, sign up for our classes, courses, um, join um, um, my and Mama Thea's uh, research circle uh, where monthly you're able to come in and meet with us and be updated on the latest research. Uh, before I leave Melanin, I do want you to know about um, one particular thing. Um, and that is our students um, did so well last year and we had this uh, these student presentations in five, four cities. The fifth one will be in October as Afia and I are traveling to Tanzania. East Africa for the fifth and final presentation by one of our students, Ayodele Duryemi. Um, but um, they, um, yeah, I just uh, blocked on it. I got to, to, uh, to there. Oh, okay. Because of how well they did, uh, one of uh, the friends of Aya Educational Institute um, has put up some money and challenged me to find, get matching money to support students and adults who want to be a part of it. But the students will get them. Adults will be a part for their own education and their own learning. But it will be to motivate our students to look at and research melanin in one particular way. And that is the role of melanin in healing breast cancer. She's a breast cancer survivor. And she wants to know, she wants these students to be engaged. And there will be first, second, and third prize for the students who engage in this research. This to me is helpful to our whole community. We need your support. If you're interested in that um, particular group that is melanin and breast cancer, not melanin as the cause of breast cancer, that would be what white folks will do as they try to go from melanoma and melanoma on the breast and then whatever. No, we're talking about melanin, the role of melanin in healing, because we know that melanin is an immune modulator. We know that melanin is a healer. Hmm. Wonder what impact does melanin have on healing breast cancer? So that's a special group. Her name is Afua um, uh, Tolliver, uh, also known as Doris Tolliver. Um, and she's supporting that. If that's something you want to support by matching uh, or contributing, you know, either money and or time and energy uh, for this particular group of students, um, then please uh, indicate so, all right? All right. How time flies when you're having fun, right? Um, so the next area for us to talk about is Black liberation psychology. Well, all right. All right, so let's let's go from this page right here. Um, first, we'll start this with a test. Fire up the text chat and name as many of these people as you can. Let me open the chat. Let's see how y'all are doing with that. Name as many of the, if y'all can see my screen. Yes, we can see Baba. Uh, there's at least one person up there they should know. <laughs> at least one. At least one. <laughs> at least one. At least one. Yep, there you go. Y'all doing good. Uh, Ajay is kicking butt. Richard Pryor. <laughs> okay. Oh, you might think he ought to be included. <laughs> oh, that is funny. Um, okay. So, um, 
what you see here is just a smattering of people. This, again, I said WHB and program development. So there's a course that will also start in September. Um, in order to graduate from Aya Educational Institute, and I'm really happy to be able to say that Aya serves middle school and high school students around the country, and in fact, around the world. We have students in other countries, and we have teachers in other countries. And, um, uh, and so one of the things that, in order to graduate with an Aya diploma, you can attend Aya and just take courses and, and benefit in those ways. But if you take enough to get an Aya diploma, 83% of our high school students who graduate with an Aya diploma get a full four-year scholarship to schools that they want to attend. 83%, not 83% graduate, not 83% get accepted, 83% get full four-year scholarships. And in order to graduate with an Aya diploma, Historically, you've had to take a course called Falsification of African Consciousness. The Falsification of African Consciousness. And of course, that course was after the, named after the book, Falsification of African Consciousness by Dr. Amos Wilson. This year, there will be an extension of that. And it's called Black Liberation Psychology. I'll talk a little bit about the ops part in a second. The extension means that we want to gather the ideas that contribute to black liberation psychology, whether or not they are trained psychologists. Of course, Dr. Wade Nobles, trained psychologist, of course, uh, Francis Cress Welsing, of course, Patricia Newton, Bobby Wright, but there were others like uh, Neely Fuller, who was not a form formally trained psychologist. The ideas of John Henry Clark, the ideas of Harriet Tubman, huh? There, the ideas of France Fanon. I didn't see anybody noticing Fanon in terms of when you were naming. The ideas of writer, Aikwe Amar. Marimba Ani is not a trained psychologist and yet her ideas in Yurugu contribute mightily to black liberation psychology, healing menticide. And so those adults and youth who take the course will have to study and master key ideas from 13. So they are not all here. 13 thinkers, writers, organizers, artists, psychologists. So at the end of the course, they will be standing on stage not just in Atlanta, though it will happen here, it happened in other places as well. And each one of them will choose of the 13 that they have learned and codified and read about, they will articulate one. So let's imagine that a person is on stage and the light comes on, this person, and they are dressed like Wade Nobles as best they can and imitate. And they, out, they articulate key ideas some key ideas, you can't articulate them all because of course, uh, Wade Nobles has been writing for years. But they, they key ideas that they've chosen that contribute to black liberation psychology and then the application of those for now. They articulate those from memory. When they're done, then they perform an original spoken word piece that they have written that encapsulates and rearticulates those ideas. And then the lights go down and behind them, a huge picture of Wade Nobles comes up. And as that light goes down, it's on another student and that student may uh, represent 
uh, Francis Cress Welsing. And they go through that. And then the last person will not be a person at all. The last character will be the representation of our culture as a protector of our psychology. And that will be expressed through a proverb battle. Some of you may, some people, we might call it a proverb cipher. A, th a theme will be thrown out. And the students, adults version and youth versions, there'll be two different ones, will then spit out proverbs rel relative to that theme. The, the other student will have to follow suit and another student will have to follow suit still on that theme or connecting to a, a part of that when, from the last proverb. If they don't, if they fail in that, then they got one strike against them. After two, they have to sit down. And the audience continues to be amazed and enriched by the cultural wisdom of our people as espoused by these students as they cipher as they compete, as they uh, bring it on. And when time is out, if two are standing, then those two win. If one is standing, then that one wins. If four are standing, then four wins. Of course, we all win because we will have, we'll have heard key ideas that contribute to Black liberation psychology from thinkers, artists, writers, psychologists, philosophers, among our people, and we will have been treated with the wisdom of our culture as espoused by us and how it can be protective of our minds, how it can heal us of menticide. Now I'm looking forward to that. That to me will be a powerful presentation that hopefully we also can do in four or five cities around the country. Now, that's the essence of, of that, given the time that we have. But there's another part that has to do with ops. And this is something that I hope you will consider. Most times when you hear of black ops, you're talking about psychological uh, operations by the military, US military and others, as they are um, using covert operations to influence the psychology. Well, when we think of black liberation psychology, most times we think of how we can protect ourselves from mental manipulation, good. How we can heal mental side, how can we can decolonize our minds, good. Can we also think of how we can plant ideas in our enemies' minds? Who are our enemies? Those who would aggress upon us. Those who mean our people no good. Those who would seek to manipulate us for their own good. Can we not only defend ourselves psychologically, can we also plant ideas that will destabilize, distract, and even in some cases where necessary, destroy those who seek to destroy us. If we haven't thought and don't think about psychological operations like that, then might it not be an indication of the colonization of our minds? If we only think about how we can block it and heal it, and not how we can also be offensive with it, is that not representative of some colonization? You remember I said all of this stems out of warriors, healers, and builders. Warriors not only are defensive, warriors also are offensive. And so that we begin to think about how we can heal ourselves of menticide and at the same time distract and disrupt those who would dominate our people 
is healing from menticide. Now, I don't want us to articulate any ideas here. That is not something for a public forum. But that we think about it and we begin to heal ourselves of not even of the notion that that's somehow beyond our purview, somehow it's immoral, somehow we can't even think about counter psychological attacks is something that we need to heal as we are talking about black psychological liberation. Unless you are convinced that we're not being warred upon psychologically in other ways. If you are convinced that we're being warred upon psychologically, then you do know that being warred upon is not the same thing as we are at war. You see, if somebody is beating on me, the war doesn't start until I fight back. It doesn't start until I punch back. Otherwise, it's just a beat down. So next time you say we're at war, ask yourself, are you challenging people, policies, and practice? What has been your hit back? That is when we are at war. Otherwise, we're being warred upon. The psychology of black liberation, black liberation psychology is what this effort is about. And hopefully you see the connections, how having a warrior healer builder mindset will not only has, have us think about how do we heal from menticide, but also how do we challenge. And I'm gonna stop there for the sake of time and open it up because it's 8.45 and I think we, We'll have some time for questions, general questions and answers or, or in this whole range. Hopefully y'all have appreciated or benefited from our uh, work so far. Wonderful presentation, Baba Wakessa. Thank you, Baba Wakessa and Aya Educational Institute. In the chat, you see his wife, Mama Thea Mazimoyo, who is dropping various links to some of the programming that Baba Wakessa is speaking about. So please make sure that if you are interested that you do check out those links for more information. Again, we're gonna now uh, start our final Q&A session for the evening. So if you have questions, you know where to place them in the Q&A box. And what we're gonna do now is just um, take some of the other questions that we didn't get to. There was a question that came earlier in the evening around Warrior Healers Builders um, and kind of speak to what you just talked about when it comes to Black liberation. So Gerald asked, in the current self-determination stance of the people of Mali, Niger, Guinea-Bissau, what must Black Americans force Black elected officials, the, v the VP, Congressional Black Caucus, Defense Secretary, AFRICOM, um, et cetera, what must uh, Black Americans force Black elected officials to do to ensure Africans get their fair deal against France and NATO? What must Black Americans do to force them? Yes, force was the... Uh, the no, no, I, I understand because it, it, it is... It is um... First, I applaud you uh, for thinking of that that is our obligation to bring whatever political and pressure we can in order to um, support uh, rightful uh, response and struggle among our brothers in um, Mali and Niger and other places. And um, My hesitation is that there are various options for, uh, for political uh, influence that I'm sure you're aware of. Um, there's writing, there is calling, there is some disruption, 
So having our voices heard, you know, by those elected officials and promising what we will do, um, protesting, raising the issues in our circles and in media, on, on social media, uh, critical. I'm not sure that that is my hesitancy is I'm not sure that it's forcing them to do anything. It is maybe influencing them and we need to do that. Quite frankly, we're not organized enough right now to force them to do anything. So we need to do that. We need to push to get use all our influence that we can, okay? And that we are not in a position to force it. That is, we're not organized. Our community integration has been invasion, okay? All right. And when I talked about warriors, healers, and builders and the need for us to know how to build with us, then we need to continue to work that. And we can use this call from Africa to stimulate us organizing more, trusting each other more, and taking on this particular issue as something that we can push for. But as we push those elected officials to do it, make sure that we're doing the work to strengthen so that after this particular effort, this the particular building, trust building, will go on, okay? So it becomes more than a moment of challenging them. The objective becomes both challenging them, but using the challenge of them to do better building. And in order to do the kind of building we need, we got to become skilled healers. And this is why we call it warriors, healers, and builders, because each particular one requires a skill set. When the only thing I have is a machete, because I'm the warrior, then when white supremacy comes out of my child's mouth, when I'm trying to organize Black people to put pressure on, uh, on others, for the goodness of Africa, and they look at me and says, uh, I'm an African descendant of, uh, I'm an American descendant of slaves, and I ain't lost none in Africa. If all I have is a machete, then I will cut them. I won't know what to do with that. And there's an African proverb that says, a healthy ear can stand hearing sick words. So in order for us to do the building, we also have to be good healers. And that's why I encourage all of you to take Warriors, Healers, and Builders courses so you understand the technology. And each time there is an issue, we're stronger. And the stronger we are, the more we can force Europeans and others to do things. Otherwise, it will be an elusive fantasy where we will be begging and call it forcing. I'll give you an example. Black Lives Matter is a, is a ask, it's a request, it's not a demand. Black power is an affirmation that we make to us. Black Lives Matter is a request that other people decide that it does. I don't mean to disparage anybody who's a part of and grew up with the Black Lives Matter movement. Keep doing what you're doing. It's just as important that we understand the psychology behind it. So that's the best I have for you right now, brother. Thank you for raising the issue because we definitely need to address it. Okay. Um, next two questions I'm going to try to combine. Um, William is asking, what do you think of the Black Achievement Fund? Are you familiar with that? And if you are, um, can you give your thoughts on that? And then I'm going to couple that question with um, the notion around reparations and what we can do for ourselves. Okay, I don't know the Black Achievement Fund. I'd love to know about it. So somebody can put a link in the text chat or how I might find out about it. I don't know about it, so I can't speak on the Black Achievement Fund. Um, the, 
reparations uh, movement is a great thing for us to do, particularly for awareness, okay? And it's a good way for us to begin to organize um, our folks. Um, at the same time, we don't need to be fooled. While on the one hand, there are some cities who are making some movements around some modicum reparations, um, the split of our people by ADOS and not ADOS and blah, 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 is unfortunate, okay? And it weakens us as far as I'm concerned. Um, and and um, and that's centered around who gonna get what money in, blah, 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 blah. Um, the other is power concedes nothing without a demand, Joe. It never did, and never will, okay? Talk about reparations. Talk about appealing to white people's moral consciousness without the power to force it. We're not forcing anything right now. We're not forcing a discussion about reparations. I hope y'all understand that. So if we're not forcing it, but those discussions are going on. And I don't mean that we, we are not raising it. Yes, and we have been raising it. And I know the history of it and I'm supportive of the history of it. It's just, we also need to know that while we're doing that, our enemy continues to work and we need to do the building work while we are outwardly pushing for it. What do I mean? You know about Florida, but there are many other, there are other states besides Florida. Florida is getting attention uh, for this, this educational uh, miseducation uh, legislation that school boards are passing because DeSantis is running for governor, I mean, for a president. But other states are doing similar things where the laws are being passed that white children and others should not be made to feel guilty for anything. And um, black history should be taught so that African captivity, what other people call slavery, I don't, what African captivity should be expressed as a skill building program for black people. Just imagine that it takes 10 years, maybe 15, as we're continuing to push the reparations agenda and those children who are eight now, nine now, now they're 19 years old, 20, 21. If they've been educated in a such a program, then when we look for, to them to pick up the mantle, they will simply say, what reparations? We need to be paying them. We have become skilled. Captivity was good for us. You see, if we ignore the moves of the enemy while we while they're in some ways dangling reparations, then we're going to miss it. Folks play a long distance game, y'all. And we have to play it as well. Do I mean stop challenging reparations? No, please challenge reparations. But use it also as an organizing tool for us to build so that we are stronger, to heal our distrust of each other. And how we do that is we practice. We practice challenging people, policies, and practices now, even as we continue to advocate for reparations. And, and I'm with Baba Clark when it comes to reparations in terms of being paid. You give me the keys to the treasury and I'll throw you some change. Now, there's also a part of reparations that, uh, that people try to include, and that is us repairing ourselves. I don't like to mix them two, okay? Because if we're talking about politically um, challenging European domination and what they owe us, that's one thing. We do need to heal and we are responsible for healing us. Our enemies certainly can't and won't. And if, if they do, we need to run. So we need to be about healing what we call injected oppression. Oppression. Some people call, um, what do they call it? In, in, in re internal, in, inner reparations or internal reparations. I don't call it reparations. I call that injected oppression. I like to use a different term. And we need to heal us. And that's why we're dedicated and have been dedicated with warriors, healers, and builders so that we learn how we're wounded and we develop a skill set for how to heal that. And we start with ourselves and our families and our organizations. 
We don't start with just pronouncements. We don't start with just more books. We start with making every relationship between black people a healing relationship. When Afia and I counsel couples, we said, if you gonna, this couple, y'all gonna work? After you get the bedroom together and all that happens, guess what? The relationship has to be a healing relationship. How have you been wounded by oppression? How's the sister been healing, wounded by oppression? And how can y'all be together, become a healing process, a healing relationship? At the couple level, at the family level, at the organizational level. And I don't just mean us going to therapy. I mean, where our everyday communication is healing. That's the tool set. And that's the standard that we have for healing oppression's wounds or warriors, healers, and builders. Next question. Well, Baba, that was um, such a profound and great uh, way to kind of come full circle to uh, tonight's topic that, and it's nine o'clock or eight to nine. So I think that's a great way to conclude um, able to bring in all those different topics. Um, some of you uh, whose questions weren't answered tonight, we do encourage you to um, check out IA Educational Institute and then take some of the courses on melanin where you will have an opportunity to get more in-depth information and have more of an interactive um, discussion with Baba Wakesa and the Institute and to get your questions answered. So um, Baba, we thank you for coming out. It's always a great pleasure um, for you to share your immense wisdom to the people in the audience. Thank you all for coming. And as you can see the hearts and the, the hand claps and the thumbs up. So please let Baba Wakesa and um, IA Educational Institute know how much you appreciated tonight's presentation. It will be available um, in a few days on the IKG um, YouTube page, IKG Cultural Resource Center. We encourage you to go to IKG Cultural Resource Center to learn more about our programming. And we invite you out next month, the third Wednesday of the month, where our speaker will be none other than our founder and director, Anthony Browder. And that will be on Wednesday, September 20th. Uh, right around the right around the equinox date so you definitely don't want to miss that and um we are going to, i'm going to actually baba wakesa allow you to have the last word uh before we officially close out so is there anything you would like to leave the audience with well i want to first of all appreciate everybody appreciate your um your comments, your questions, uh, those of you who, uh, Brian, for example, who named everybody that was on there, you know, France Fanon, Wade Nobles, appreciate that. I appreciate your participation uh, and your comments and your uh, uh, deciding to come and listen and your being active in it. Uh, it means the world to me. Um, and, uh, and I want to thank you. Also, I want to thank IKG. I want to thank Brother Tony Browder. I want to thank Ajwa. I wanna thank those who are responsible for continuing to bring this kind of wisdom on Wednesdays, okay? And for thinking enough of me and I Education Institute to, uh, to include us. All right. Absolutely, absolutely. So again, thank you all for joining us. Please, again, um, the links to I Education Institute are in the chat. So um, everyone, please save the chat. Uh, and there were quite a few links that were provided. So um, we're going to um, wish you all a wonderful rest of your evening and week and see you all next month. Um, good evening, everyone.